Well, it's good to be with you all this morning. It's always a privilege to open up the Word of God and study it together to see what God has to say to us today. If you brought your Bibles, and I hope you did, turn with me to the book of James. James chapter 5. And while you're turning there, I thought I might share a personal story this morning to help us hopefully ease into the text today. Uh, And it's the story of how Jesse and I met and ultimately how I proposed. So we met in January of 2011. Uh, It was a semi-blind date where we first met. Our mutual friends set us up. We were able to talk on the phone prior to meeting the semi-blind, and we had snuck some pictures of each other online, you know, so it wasn't blind-blind. But we met on a semi-blind date. There was four of us, and it went so well, I asked her on another date the next day. And three days later, I asked her to be my girlfriend. One week later, I told her I loved her. Uh, And let's see... Nine months total, I proposed. Six months later, we were married. So I met her in January 2011. We were married by May 2012. So for me, there are people who have faster stories than that. But for me, that seems fast. It was an out-of-body experience. Even as we were dating, second date, we're talking about our future together. What it might look like. Are we going to have kids? Where will we live? I mean, I remember these things, and I'm like, wow, I would never want my child to do that. But it's just one of those things, I guess, when the Lord is moving and you just kind of know, you know it's true, but not always the case, you know, and that's the way it kind of turned out. So the proposal, um, when we, let's see, eight months, yeah, about eight months in, uh, I knew that I wanted to propose. I knew that she was the one. I told my my parents, and uh, I had gotten permission from her father. And so my mom and my grandmother set out to help me find a ring. And so they went looking for a ring. It was like a Tuesday or Wednesday when they found it. They had collected information for me secretly from her. And uh, my grandmother contributed the, the diamond ring, the diamond that's in her ring. And uh, so they had it, got all made up. They brought it home. It was like a Wednesday. And gifts burn holes in my pocket. Surprises I do not hold well. I want to go ahead and get it out. So I had no plan, but I was like, okay, I can't hold on to this ring for days, weeks, till I have a plan. I need a plan. So my sister was a, was a dance major at, at USF in Tampa, and that Friday, she had a showcase um, going on. And so I concocted, in my random bravery, this idea that I would ask her instructor, her professor who was putting on the showcase, to put on and host a fake raffle drawing. And only my family would have tickets, but he would present it as the whole audience had it. And of course, Jesse would be the winner, and I would be the one that comes on stage with some flowers, and I would propose to her. So the day of, he was awesome. The professor was awesome to do this. On the day of, you know, I got my words and I'm writing them out, what, how I'm going to say it. You know, I've been practicing them all week and getting more nervous as the, as the time approaches. It's about, I don't know, 100 to 200 people in the auditorium. You know, I know nine of them. And uh, so, <laughs> so during the show, we get towards the end of it, and I, I sneak out under the pretense of some, some stomach problems, you know, which I was nervous. That's how I, that's how I justified that. Went around back, my sister snuck me in, and so the, I get on stage, and I'm standing off to the side there. And uh, he begins, he comes out and he begins to do the raffle drawing. And he names Jesse, and, you know, Jesse's shocked and surprised because she never wins anything. And she comes up on stage and he says, you know, I think we have a, our prize for it. We have someone special to bring it out. So I came out, and she thought the flowers I was holding was the raffle drawing present, that she had won it, the flowers. And so obviously it was me, and so I, you know, I, I in front of strangers and everything, I kind of shared my heart as loud as I could so that people could hear it. I uh, got down on one knee and proposed. So on that stage in an auditorium filled with a lot of family and even more strangers, in that moment between my question and her answer, it felt like there was a lot at stake. And to some extent, that's true. There was a lot at stake, but she said yes, much to my relief and joy. And yet, much more than I could have imagined was riding on the truthfulness of her yes. And so I share this story with you this morning to get to this question, which is, can you imagine with me for a moment what it would have been like for me if she had said yes, but truly didn't mean it? What if I found out that it was mainly the epicness of the moment or the pressure of the moment of the onlooking crowd that got her to say yes? What if she decided she didn't love me enough to go through with it and stay true to her yes? I would have experienced a full range of emotions, to be sure. Embarrassment, grief, rejection, frustration, anger even. I would have felt lied to a little bit. I I thought I had this connection with her. But she said yes. And from that moment on, the engagement, 
our wedding, where the official vows were given before God as witness, ten years of life and three children were all riding on the truthfulness of her yes, and of course mine. So my proposal had a happy ending, but not all proposals do. It's not just in marriage where we see commitments are easily made and too easily broken. We see it in other relationships, do we not, between family and friends? Fathers promise to show up for their kids and then don't. Kids promise to obey next time, but don't. Friends say they got your back and then they let you down. I know this next one is low-hanging fruit, but I got to use it. Politics, broken campaign promises, position flips. Sometimes they'll go back on their words and contradict their commitment days apart from what they said. One of my favorite social media accounts when I'm not fasting from social media is Defiant L's. Defiant, the letter L, apostrophe S. Defiant L's. The sole purpose of this account is to put up receipts, screenshots, of social media posts other people out there have made either prior to having a certain stance and then after having a certain stance. And it just shows the hypocrisy of what they said, how they went back completely 180 on what they were saying. I just love it. They put them up there side by side. It could be a politician. It could be a celebrity. It could be just a personality that's out there. It could be a random Joe Blow. But he'll just put up, hey, here's something that they said yesterday, last week, last month, last year, and here's them totally contradicting going back on what they said. And it's just there for the audience to enjoy and laugh at and see how fickle people are with our words and our commitments. And what are the effects of hollow commitments and broken promises? What's the impact of these things? Well, for the victim, we'll call it the victim, there certainly can be physical pain, certainly can be emotional pain at times, but ultimately I think there's a loss of respect and trust. And for the culprits... Their word loses its meaning. Their character and integrity are stained. And going forward, they are driven to make more promises, and those promises have to be bolder so they can convince the person that they lied to last time that this time I mean it. I swear. I swear on fill in the blank. This time I mean it. Perhaps you can think of someone whose word has come to mean very little to you who is thoughtless when making a commitment. Perhaps you and I have been guilty of this ourselves. Maybe you told someone you'd do something and then didn't, or wouldn't do something and then did. Maybe you told someone you'd be there and then you weren't. Would others in your life describe you as reliable and truthful to your word? What's the safest way for a Christian to be so? To answer this, we turn to the Word of God this morning in James chapter 5, verse 12. And if you don't mind, if you're able, let's stand together and read James chapter 5, verse 12 together, out loud. The Word of God says, But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. I've titled the message this morning, Because He Said Yes. Because He Said Yes. Because I want you to know right up front that although we're going to look at important elements in and around this verse this morning, like its meaning, its context, what God says in general about oaths, promises, and vows, how this verse is connected to the rest of James's letter. Although we will examine ourselves against God's standard for our words and commitments, James would say, looking in the mirror of God's word, we will ultimately conclude by lifting up our eyes to Jesus Christ and the promises that are really and truly ours to possess because he said yes. And unlike us sinners, his yes always means yes. So look with me again this morning at the verse, James 5, chapter 12. But above all, my brothers, do not swear. Now, the meaning of the word swear here is not talking about offensive language or curse words, although we shouldn't do that either. There are other verses for that. Referring to a solemn promise. To swear, in this sense, is to solemnly promise regarding future acts or behavior. It's an oath, a vow. 
And what we must know this morning is that appropriate oaths and vows are allowed in Scripture. Not all vows are forbidden. God permitted oaths. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 20 through 21, the Word of God says, <clears throat> excuse me, You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and hold fast to him, and by his name you shall swear. In some cases, it was even commanded as a divine means to settle disputes. In Exodus chapter 22, verses 10 through 12, if a man gives to his neighbor a donkey or an ox or a sheep or any beast to keep safe, and it dies or is injured or is driven away without anyone seeing it, an oath by the Lord shall be between them both to see whether or not he has put his hand to his neighbor's property. The owner shall accept the oath, and he shall not make restitution. But if it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to its owner. So we see just a couple of examples this morning that oaths and vows were allowed and appropriate, as long as they were made according to Scripture. So what is forbidden then? Well, if appropriate oaths and promises are allowed, then the ones that are forbidden are inappropriate oaths and vows. That's right. Now, what makes an oath or a vow or a promise inappropriate? That's what we want to look at this morning. For that, we want to look at our main verse. Look at the next portion. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. So what he's talking about here is swearing or promising by any other authority than God's. Heaven or earth represents anything in creation. And even James writes, or any other oath, meaning anything else you can think of. Don't do it. For example, today, the song, I Swear, a beautiful, romantic example of a forbidden, inappropriate vow. I swear, by what? By God, by the moon, and the stars in the sky. That's an example. It's an inappropriate vow. It's not acknowledging God's authority. I've just ruined that for some of you. We also see some other examples from Scripture as we just look at examples. Um, we see making careless oaths or promises that you don't intend to uphold from the moment you say it. Or making brash or impetuous oaths that you're going to regret keeping. I do have an example for us this morning from this. In Judges chapter 11, it's a story of Jephthah. You may or may not be familiar with that story. We're going to spend a couple minutes on it. Jephthah was a man who had been outcast by his family in Israel. This was during the time of the Judges. The best verse to summarize the book of Judges is, everyone did what was right in their own eyes because there was no king in Israel. And so you have just moral depravity at its highest in the nation. And occasionally, as other groups came in, it would oppress the Israelites as God was judging them and getting them, trying to get them to snap out of their depravity and their immorality and come back to him, stop worshiping false gods. Eventually, the cry of the people would redirect back to the one true God, and they would ask for deliverance. And God, in his gracious mercy, would raise up judges occasionally. And the book of Judges is about the stories of these judges that God would raise up. And one of them was Jephthah. In Judges chapter 11, verses 30 through 31, the word of the Lord says, <clears throat> And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites, that's the enemies, into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Now, if you're familiar with this story, those of you who are, who or what was the first thing to come out of his door when he got home? His daughter, an only child. He tells her. She's devastated. She asked for two months to mourn because she was a virgin. She wasn't married. She knew that her life was over. So she was given two months to mourn, and then devastated, Jephthah followed through with it. He followed through with his oath, which we, in our modern sensibilities, just can't imagine. Now, the emphasis on this text in Judges, I want us to remember this, and then we'll move on. The emphasis in this text on Judges is not for us to commend Jephthah for his honoring his word to the Lord, Okay? In this story, that's in the background. In the background, it's absolutely expected you're going to hold your word to the Lord because you made a vow to God. 
So we're not commending him. What we're looking at here is a brash and impetuous vow that he came to regret. He didn't have to make a vow. If God had called him to deliver the people, guess what? He was going to deliver the people. Just when you think someone in Judges gets it right, they ruin it for themselves or for other people. Samson is a good story about that very thing. He ruins it for himself. Gideon, 300 men, takes on and destroys this army. You know, they, they, they win this amazing victory where God was whittling down the army. He invites household idols into his home when it's all over. So the emphasis in the book of Judges is to show the deep character flaws and depravity of the nation of Israel as reflected in the ones who saved them. That's the guy that saves us? Israel is supposed to be ashamed and embarrassed of this history in Judges. The best God could raise up was this guy who made that vow, was Samson who couldn't control his lust for women, was Gideon who wanted to be worshipped himself and had all this power and authority afterwards. It was a reflection on Israel itself. And I think the church today should look to that. When we see church leaders falling, who do you think that's a reflection of? Not just those men and those women, but the church. But the church. If that's our leadership, there's problems in the church. And that's what God was teaching Israel and the judges. It's also meant to make them look forward, but we'll get there later. But we see the impetuousness of this vow. That's an example of an inappropriate vow. But what we do see even in the reaction of Jephthah's daughter, who went through with it, was the seriousness of keeping vows, especially when and because God is invoked in the vow as witness and judge. No doubt Jephthah was familiar with the verse like Numbers 30, verses 1 and 2. Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the people of Israel, saying, This is what the Lord has commanded. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And that, we can surmise, is what drove Jephthah to his response in Judges 11, verse 35. And as soon as Jephthah saw her, his daughter, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, meaning he had just been humbled. And you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. That is a respect and seriousness of keeping vows to God that has been lost today. I appreciate how clearly the London Baptist Confession of Faith captures this seriousness in the Bible's teaching on this. In chapter 23, paragraph 2, they write, People should swear by the name of God alone, and only with the utmost holy fear and reverence, Therefore, to swear an empty or ill-advised oath by that glorious and awe-inspiring name or to swear by all, by anything else, is sinful and to be abhorred. So what's the best way to avoid these sins for us today? Let's look at the next part of our verse this morning. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now, there are a lot of similarities in James' letter to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. Some people even said that he's heavily influenced. He's really just kind of walking through and referring back to the words of Jesus when he taught this great sermon that we have in Matthew. And this is an example of this. So what did Jesus say in regards to oath and vows? We look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. Literally the word of God, the living word, says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So Jesus' solution to the problem of the inappropriate vows and promises people were making is to stop making them at all. Now this puts James' words, do not swear, at the beginning of five, chapter 5, verse 12, in a slightly different light. 
Maybe James is fully repeating Jesus and echoing his sentiment, saying, don't swear at all. But don't let Jesus' words here float inside the vacuum. We've already seen that appropriate vows and oaths are allowed. So this isn't a blanket statement to never make a vow or promise, otherwise we can't get married anymore. We can't call God to witness this covenant union that we enter into. It doesn't happen inside of a vacuum. We know the appropriate vows are allowed. It's okay, it's appropriate to ask God to be a witness and judge who holds people in the parties in this uh, covenant accountable, settle disputes. We used to have a, it used to be a big deal. I don't know if they do it anymore or not, but to give a court testimony, right? You invoke the authority of God for your truthfulness, that God was supposed to judge you at some point in your life or after for whether or not you were truthful in that court case. And of course, marriages as well. So it's reasonable to understand that what Jesus and James is probably talking about here is the level of interpersonal relationships, your day-to-day interaction with people. To prevent sinning against God by not following through or by trying to lessen the promise you make by promising on something lesser than God, Jesus would say, just let your yes be yes. Just let your no be no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So James echoes that. Let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. Who wants God to actually literally judge them for their words? Certainly we don't. But marriage is such a good example that when we do invoke him, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. There is no higher authority in existence than the one who gave all existence to us. Now, this is not easy. We're living in and amongst a culture that is unforgiving, that is hypocritical, fickle, God-offending, and promise-breaking. And yet, plenty of non-Christians know and believe that character and integrity matter. How much more important, then, should it be for believers to have high character and integrity, especially when it comes to meaning what we say and following through? I think this is where it fits in with James's letter. Because if we look at some of the themes of James's letter that we've come across so far in the first four chapters, we see some themes emerge such as trials shape Christians. You don't know what kind of Christian you are until you're going through a trial. You don't know. Because when things are good, you may or may not be walking with the Lord daily, but when things go bad, at some point, if they get bad enough, you will get back to the Lord. And it's only then, when things are going bad, that you can shape and form your heart, and God shapes and forms us and sanctifies us to be more like Christ when the hard times are in there and coming. Trials shape Christians. That's how Christians are formed and built up. Another thing we see in James is faith without works is dead. Do not be just a hearer of the word of God, but be a doer of the word of God. Don't say you have faith in God and then no one knows, no one can tell. Your life's not governed by your faith in God day to day. That means you're just a hearer and not a doer. So we see this back and forth in James's letter because these Christians were going through a lot. And so he's telling them, in spite of what you're going through, You've got to know that these trials come from the Lord. You've got to know that God allows everything into your life. You have to know that. That if it's here and happening to you, he's allowed it. The devil stays on God's leash. See Job. So if he allows that to happen, then what he's wanting you to do is learn how to respond in it. My child, how would I have you walk through this? And as you do that, leaning on his strength, you become shaped and formed into Christ, into his son, which is his goal for you and me after salvation. So our behavior should reflect Christ at all times. In, in kind of a subtext, James is saying, even if you're going through it, just because life sucks for you right now, you can't stop being a Christian. No matter how bad it gets, you have no right now. You've been bought with a price, the blood of Jesus. You have no right to cast off Christ and go back to your old man or woman. No. Stay in it. Walk as best you can next to the Lord through those hard times, and he will shape and form. Your behavior must match your faith. And that includes our words. 
And so we see James on a couple of occasions in his letter go directly to the tongue and talk about the words and the tongue. James chapter 1, verse 26. The word of God says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. In James chapter 3, and really the whole chapter talks about the tongue and speaking. I just pulled out verses 8 through 10. Speaking of the tongue, the word of God says, It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. My wife and I would say when we catch each other using less than flattering words or attitudes, we'll say, do you praise God with that mouth? We've got one instrument to praise God. So as we look into the mirror of God's word this morning on oaths and vows and promises, the questions we need to ask ourselves this morning is, with the Holy Spirit as witness, am I guilty of not keeping my word? In my family, am I reliable? Does my yes mean yes? Does my no mean no in my family? Do they know this? Would they say this of me? In my church, Does my yes mean yes and my no mean no? When I joined a church and said that I wanted to covenant with this community, this is my local church, this is the body of Christ, the part of the body of Christ to which I choose to belong and do life together, did you mean it? Or do you drift in and out? For me as a pastor, I remember being ordained right here, elders laying hands on me, a full auditorium as witnesses, and most importantly, God himself has witnessed, and I pledge to God that I would be a minister of the gospel for the rest of my life. I find it very comforting, because on days when I doubt myself or I feel like I'm not making an effort, I say, it doesn't matter. I made a vow to God. And sometimes I remind God, God, whether I was meant to do this or not, when you get in those low days, God, whether I'm doing a great job or not, I made a vow to you. And since I'm going to be doing it anyway, maybe you can help me be a good one for your glory. Because I made a vow. To God, with God as witness. Does my yes mean yes? My fellow elders in the church, does your yes mean yes when you said you would be an elder to the church? That you would do what elders from the Bible are supposed to do? Let your yes be yes. And just before God, individual brothers and sisters in Christ, does your yes mean yes to God? So as you think about this this morning, hopefully you're thinking, well, how do I recover it? If my yes doesn't mean yes, if my character and integrity in my family or in my church or before God has been stained, and I know that I tend to speak brashly and make impetuous promises or oaths or commit and then break them all the time, I just I don't know if I have that integrity. How do I recover from this? Because I want to change. This is what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts. He, can, he convicts us to change, to be more like Christ. Well, one is confess. Confess. Confess to God where you've broken your word to him. Treat it seriously even like Jephthah did. Confess to God. Then go and confess to the people you break your word against. Tell them that you've been wrong. Tell them that, hey, I should be keeping my word. Not just so that we can get along, but that so I honor God, who I think is worthy of me keeping my word. James might even tell you to be slow to speak. Those who are slow in making promises are the most faithful in keeping them because they understand the weight of a promise. And then if you give it, if you do give your word, take it seriously and keep it. You can pretend to care, but you can't pretend to show up. Let your yes from your mouth mean yes from your heart. Let your yes be yes. Again, I turn to the London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 23, paragraph 4. It says, an oath is to be expressed in the plain and ordinary meaning of the words, without any ambiguity or mental reservation. So as we return to the opening story of my wife's yes, those years ago, 10 years ago now, what do you think Jesse thought she was getting because she said yes? I know what it's supposed to mean she was getting. I just think about the wedding vows. She's supposed to get a lifelong partner committed to her, whether we're healthy, whether she's sick, whether we've got money and can pay the bills or we can't. Someone who's going to love her for her, even when I don't feel like it. Provide for her, protect her, support her. 
And that's what she should be getting. Those are great things. Those are great things. But even if I somehow manage to fulfill every bit of those vows before I go, she's still married to a fallen, sinful human being who at different times and in different ways has let her down or hurt her feelings. And so my fulfillment of my promises that I've made in this earthly plane, in this fallen body, pale, pale in comparison to what she receives because he said yes. Because he said yes. Now, there are all kinds of covenants in the Bible. When you read the Bible, you'll see God making covenants and promises throughout. And it's important that we be able to read and understand where they apply in history and what ones apply to us today or what ones carry over, what ones stop. But you see covenants. It's a common concept. Promises, oaths, covenants made between God and man. But there's one in particular that I've recently learned of that I thought was beautiful and eye-opening to what God has done for us. And it's called the Pactum Salutis. That's Latin. The Pactum Salutis. It's the covenant of redemption. The agreement of salvation. Now, it's very similar to the doctrine of the Trinity. So what the Bible teaches about the Trinity, if you did a word search for the word Trinity, are you going to find it in the Bible? No. But are the elements and the components there throughout the whole counsel of God to support the doctrine of the Trinity? Yes, that's what it's built. The Trinity is meant to describe these elements and components that we put together to see what, God, what God's nature and essence is. We see Jesus ascribed worship and glory as divine. We see the Holy Spirit being sent from God the Father, God the Son, dwelling in believers, that Jesus defends the Holy Spirit and says, anyone blasphemes the Holy Spirit, it's gone, done. The Holy Spirit teaches, teaches, teaches us, teaches believers. And so we see divinity in the Father, divinity in the Son, and divinity in the Holy Spirit. So that teaching is all co- coalesced into the doctrine of the Trinity. So this covenant, the pactum salutis, the agreement of salvation is like that. I don't have a passage to turn to. You won't find it if you word search it. But the components throughout the whole counsel of God are there to show us what? That there was an agreement between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit way before Genesis 1-1 that they were going to save humanity. In his book, The Sacred Bond, one author describes it this way. The covenant of redemption is a pact between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with the purpose of redeeming God's elect. The Father gave to the Son those whom he chose to save and required him to accomplish their salvation through his obedient life and atoning death as the second Adam. He promised the Son a reward on completion of his work. The Son, accepting the Father's gift, agreed to the conditions of this covenant and submitted himself to the Father's will. The Holy Spirit promised to apply the benefits earned by the Son to the elect and unite them with the Son forever. Thus, we say the covenant of redemption is an intra-Trinitarian covenant between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. See, we tend to think that what we see happening in life is random and things are going on. And yeah, God's in control at some point, but not really. But what this teaching, this summary of the teaching of Scripture tells us is that from the beginning, from before Genesis 1-1, this wasn't just a random response to humankind that God did. God said, this is what we're going to do. The Father said, I'm going to give you this job. The Son said, yes, Father, I will submit to that. I will volunteer for that. Holy Spirit said, I will volunteer to apply the benefits that you earn on earth for the people. And we see this agreement and this covenant made between the holy triune God. The covenant established in eternity between the Father who gives the Son to be the Redeemer of the elect and requires of him the conditions of their redemption. And the Son who voluntarily agrees to fulfill these conditions and the Spirit who voluntarily applies the work of the Son to the elect. If the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit, if it were even possible, were not in agreement and did not say yes, you and I are dead. Dead. No hope. None. Zero. Dead. But he said yes. Our salvation has been enacted. Our salvation has been achieved and secured because God said yes. Now, make no mistake this morning, I told you we would turn to Jesus, but I want to make sure we understand this. They're equal, co-equal, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God the Father is to be praised and glorified, as is the Holy Spirit. But Christians understandably focus on the person and work of God the Son, seeing as how it is Jesus' work and name that is the only work and name by which we can be saved. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, the Word of God says, And there is salvation in no one else. There was no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
So because Jesus said yes, our atonement was accomplished. It is Jesus who sat in the garden the night before his death, and his human nature wanted out. His human nature was terrified of the wrath of God. But his divine nature knew, being nourished by the Holy Spirit, knew, not my will, but your will. I've already made it. I've already decided. This decision was made before we, before we ever got here. Not my will, but yours be done. And it was Jesus who hung on the cross just before his death and said, it is finished. So because Jesus said, yes, our atonement is accomplished. Because Jesus said, yes, our sanctification will continue. It was Jesus who ascended after his resurrection. He went back to the Father and he said, it's for your benefit that I go back to the Father because we will send a helper. We will send a teacher, a comforter, who can dwell in and among every believer that makes up the church so that we can walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh, so that we can have God in us to become more like God the Son in how we live out our lives honoring God the Father. Because Jesus said, yes, our sanctification will continue. Philippians 1.6, He that began a good work in you, will be faithful to complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. And finally, because Jesus said yes, our glorification is assured. It is a done deal. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and receive you so that where I am, you can be also. Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, the word of God says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Paul can't stop talking about this, because in 2 Corinthians, he writes again, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. The reason Christians can say God's promises to me are true and sure and reliable is because of Jesus Christ. In him, all promises find their yes and amen. Wow. Wow. That is why, Paul continues, it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. All because he said yes. Aren't you glad that God's yes means yes? Yes. (laughs) In every other religion, those gods of those other religions look and sound just like humans. They're fickle. They're petty. They become enraged. They have no justice. But not Yahweh. Not Yahweh. His yes means yes. He is not a man that he should lie. The Bible says, let God be true. Every man a liar. God is not made in our image. We are made in his. Doesn't it flood your soul with gratitude and humility to consider all that you receive because of Christ and the truthfulness and reliability of his word? This is the same overwhelming gratitude that is expressed throughout the scriptures, Old Testament included. There is a faithfulness that God demonstrates to his word all along the way because he doesn't lie. When you ask, why did God keep rescuing faithless, fickle, and flawed Israel? Because of his faithfulness to his own word. Because he said he would. Because he said yes. When you think to yourself, why would such an awesome and holy God continue to uphold someone like you? Despite the sinfulness in your heart and the condemnation that comes with that sin. Because of his faithfulness to his own word. Because he said yes. He said he would. 
Jesus said, all that the Father gives to me, I will uphold, and none will be taken out of my hand. So we are sustained because he said yes. Paul understood this better than many. He wrote in chapter 5 of Romans, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How in the world do we have peace with God? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I'm telling you, Paul won't shut up. In Romans chapter 8, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. In the light of this amazing reality, how then should we respond to a command that we see in James? How should we respond to let our yes be yes and our no be no? Well, if you're a believer this morning, if Christ has saved your soul, you have repented of your sins and you've confessed your sins to God and you've asked Jesus to wash you with his blood and to apply his righteousness that he earned in his life to your account by faith, then as we go, confession should be a a daily thing for us. We should always be confessing, always be making sure that our heart is clean before God because we fail each and every day. So believer, brother and sister, just confess, apologize, make amends for your word, not for not following through on your word. Respond, believer, brothers and sisters, with obedience. Start doing it. Start letting your yes be yes and your no be no from here on out. You can do this with confidence. We can share in the virtue of Christ now, today, because of what he has accomplished for us, because he's been given us the spirit as the guarantee. We're meant to reflect more than just the image of God. We're meant to reflect the character of God because God is in us. We can grow into men and women whose yes means yes and no means no because of he who lives within us. And finally, respond with gratitude. We stand not under God's wrath, but under God's grace. Don't be discouraged if you've got to earn your trust back with people. You have nothing left to earn with God. People in your life may never forget the old you. And they may look at every opportunity to bring up the old you. It's okay. Do it anyway. Walk with integrity anyway. Don't give up. Well, they're never going to see me in a different light, so I just won't try. (coughs) Don't do that. Remember, the, the life you're living now is not unto people. The life we live now is unto God. He is our ultimate authority. Don't get discouraged. Remember, you don't have to earn anything with God anymore. You couldn't earn anything to begin with. Let me clarify that theologically, okay? But you don't have anything to earn. It's not that now that he saved you, you have to keep earning it to maintain it. It's a perfect gift. He's the giver, and he does not take back. Now, if you're an unbeliever this morning, if you have not placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the salvation of your sins, Forgiveness of your sins and your salvation. It is true. You've been hearing us talk about the greatness of God and how he, his yes means yes. But it is also true that his no means no. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You'll hear Christians sometimes talk about salvation is not works-based salvation. But in a way, it is. God laid out his standards. He gave Israel ten commandments. He said, if you can keep these, you have salvation. What was the problem? Nobody can keep it. Nobody on earth can live the perfect life. If you're going to be in God's presence, who is perfect, you've got to be perfect. So salvation is works-based, but only Jesus Christ could fulfill the work. And because Jesus Christ fulfilled the work, he did it on your behalf, and it's applied to you by faith. So many times we skip over his life. He came, 
He died. He rose again. Well, he, he lived, right? How then did he live? Perfectly, without sin, under the law of God that had been given to man, so that those who place their faith in him have his account applied to him now, applied to them. That's amazing. That's amazing. He lived a life. It wasn't that God said, there's no standards no more. It was like, yeah, here are the standards. And the agreement was that Jesus would come and live the standards that he knew we would never get to. And he did. And so there's this exchange when you come to Jesus. You're casting your sins on him. And he gives you his righteousness by faith. See, the problem is we can be decent people. We can be good people. But the standards of God is you've got to be perfect. You've got to follow his law perfectly, perpetually, and personally. You've got to do it in your own life at all times as long as you live. We've all already messed up. You got to three years old, four years old, you messed up. Not honoring your father and your mother. But... God's solution was Jesus, and God's demands to you this morning, if you are not sure, if you are saved, is to repent of your sins and believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. That is God's demand to the world. It doesn't matter if the world drives by today, never having gone to church. It doesn't matter if the world tries to convince everybody else that there is no God, that man is the ultimate authority. It doesn't matter. God has a demand. And it was the first message we have recorded from Jesus when he began his ministry. Repent! And believe, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It doesn't matter what the world says. Those are God's demands. No one will get to heaven, the presence of God, without repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. You say, what about Old Testament saints? Well, what about them? Jesus wasn't even here yet. This agreement was way before Genesis 1-1. And the Bible tells us that This was the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. That God sees the end from the beginning. That God was allowing the end time death of Jesus to be applied counter counter retroactively. (laughs) Retroactively to these saints that put their faith in God. The mechanism was always faith. The difference is before the cross, they thought it was faith in God with this shadow of a sacrifice through animals, knowing that animals don't really do the trick. And then when Christ came, that was God's revelation. This is how I put up with animals, was because of my son. No one gets to the Father but through Jesus Christ. But I have to tell you, if you're an unbeliever, listen, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you to be a Christian. It's going to cost you a death to yourself. It's going to cost you a life no longer belonging to you. Your dreams, your goals, your desires, they're gone. They belong to God now. And if God wants to do some of the things you had in mind, great. But if he doesn't, as a believer, we say that's great too. It's going to cost you. You have to live in this world, but you can't be of it anymore because you're not. You can live in and among it, but you can't be of it. And that's going to cost you. Friendships, it's going to cost you work. It's going to cost you things in life. Reputation and around the world is costing people their lives. Jesus said, count the cost if you're going to follow me. Following Christ is not easy and it's not for fakers or pretenders, but it's worth it. It's worth it. God has already decided that if you will repent and place your faith in Jesus Christ, he will save you. It's already been decided upon. And God's rewards are justification, being declared right in the eyes of God because of Jesus. Adoption, the reason you're in the world but not of it anymore is because you've been adopted by God. He is now your father. Sanctification, he promises that you won't be the same old fleshly you 100% of the time. That 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 percentage counter will start to drain across the course of your life on how much of the flesh dominates and the spirit will begin to rise inside of you because this Holy Spirit has been put inside of you for new desires, new goals new loves, God above all else. And his rewards are glorification and a future inheritance because he said yes. Let's pray.